With the 1894 election came the first big political realignment of the Third Republic, as conservative Catholics began to rally behind the French Republic for the first time. Even Albert de Munn, the leader of a monarchist coalition, accepted the Republic's existence on the condition it did not wage war against religion. The progressive Republicans had managed to hang on to power by forming an alliance with those very Catholic Republicans, whose priorities were aligned with that of the new progressives in a multitude of ways. The progressives had won the 1893 election on a platform of ensuring stability for the national institutions, both of a republic and of French society at large. Despite this promise, the republic would soon be faced by its greatest crisis yet. The 1898 French legislative election took place on the 8th and 22nd of May, 1898 to elect 581 deputies to the French National Assembly. The triumph of the progressives had elevated Jean Casimir Perrier to the Prime Ministership, who assumed office following tenuous negotiations in the House of Deputies as the progressives alone did not command an absolute majority of the seats. The Casimir Perrier cabinet will only last six months, and that short time will be dominated by the question of what concessions to give to ralliers as well as the anarchist question. The most chaotic day of Casimir Perrier's premiership would come mere days after he took office, on the 9th of December 1893, when an anarchist terrorist called Auguste Vaillant would walk into the House of Deputies in the middle of a debate and threw a bomb containing dozens of nail bits of zinc. No one would be killed, but over 50 deputies would suffer injuries. Vaillant would soon be guillotined, but this only emboldened the anarchists, who saw Vaillant as a martyr for their cause. Attacks would continue, with one even happening at the Foyle restaurant, which was located just in front of a Luxembourg palace, the building where the Senate was housed. This would all culminate on the 24th of June, 1894, when President Sadi Carnot would be assassinated on a visit to Lyon by Geromino Casario, an Italian anarchist. Pressure would be placed on the Casimir Perrier government to act, and just days after the House of Deputies bombing, several bills would be submitted to be voted on to deal with the anarchist terror threat. The first of these laws, all of which would be nicknamed as the villainous laws by anarchists and other left-wing groups, will make advocacy of any crime in itself a crime, even if done indirectly, as an attempt to crack down on the attack that has been promoted by the anarchist press. The second law would come mere days later that would attempt to expand the scope of persecutions to even those of anarchist sympathies. The third of these laws would come in July, after President Sadi Carnot had been assassinated and Casimir Perrier had been replaced as Prime Minister by returning Charles Dupuis. This law would go the furthest of all and would allow the government to shut down any anarchist newspaper and spy on private anarchist political meetings, while using a definition of anarchism so vague it could allow for the crackdown of all Marxist-aligned political opponents of the government. This law would face strong criticism from the Workers' Party, who feared the possibility of the law being used to target them. A young deputy named Jean Jaurès, who was a rising star within the ranks of a Workers' Party, would give a fiery speech on the floor of a house criticizing the government for supposedly putting the interests of a bourgeois class before the common liberty with this law. Jaurès would appeal to the reformist liberalism that the Republicans had been guided on under Jules Ferry and other previous Republican administrations, both in his speech and in a newspaper article he wrote on the law the day before. The Dupuy government would last until January 1895, when it would lose confidence in the House, and Alexandre Ribot would be called back to become Prime Minister once more. The Ribot government would not last long either, as it would be unable to deal with the continuing Carmel mine strikes that had started three years earlier. With three progressive governments in a row having fallen so fast, the new president, Félix IV, would call upon Léon Bourgeois, the new leader of the radicals following Clemenceau's defeat, to form his government. He would focus his tenure on the goal of creating a new income tax, but the government was weakened from the beginning as it did not have majority support and his income tax plan ended up going nowhere. He too would resign in April 1896, just five months into his tenure. Four would next appoint Jules Mellin, another progressive. Mellin had first been elected to parliament in a by-election in 1872, and had gotten his political career rolling by serving as the agriculture minister in the second ferry cabinet, and had been the one behind the protectionist laws passed under Charles de Freycinet's last government. The Mellin government would become the first long-lasting progressive government, as it would last more than two years into June 1898, past even the election that year. Mellin would work to put into place the promise that had been given to rally years so long ago, by officially dropping anti-clericalism. Such ideals had already been formulated in the speech Charles Dupuy gave before the House in 1894, in which he called for a new spirit of religious toleration towards the faithful, stating that he went in line with the Republican value of liberty. Under Mellie's policies, public displays of religion would be tolerated in ways they hadn't for decades, and French Catholicism would undergo a sort of revival. Mellin would also work to balance the budget, while at the same time avoiding the creation of an income tax, something that made it very popular amongst farmers and business. He was no ultra-conservative, however, as his government would also introduce the policy of the blame for work accidents being shared by the boss. He would also create a state-run benefit society to assist the ill and unemployed. 
Despite the stability of Melian's government, a new crisis would emerge from outside the political sphere that threatened said stability. In late 1894, a young French artillery officer named Alfred Dreyfus would be wrongly found guilty of having conspired with Germany against France. Over documents found that showed that someone in the French army had leaked artillery schematics to a German military attaché. The Dreyfus affair, as it would be called, would slowly ramp up in prominence until it became too big to act as if it wasn't happening. As it continued calls of those who supported Dreyfus, known as the Dreyfusards, for a retrial became louder as the movement grew. Melian ignored the calls, however, and did not push for a retrial, seeing the case as something that should be left to the judiciary, even as there were voices from within the House of Deputies pushing on him to act. The progressives, led by Melian, would go into the 1898 election continuing their call for stability, seeing the Dreyfus affair as a destabilizing force that the national government did not have a big enough stake in to interfere. After his disaster of a government, Léon Bourgeois would lose his status as the leader of the radicals in the house, and that honor would pass back to former Prime Minister Henri Brisson, who had reassumed his old position as president of the house in December 1894 after it had been vacated by Charles Dupuis. The monarchist coalition, who I shall now refer to as the nationalists due to them having dropped monarchism, continued to push for the defense of the Catholic faith and for the preservation of tradition. Leader Albert de Mun had lost his seat in an 1893 election, but he was soon re-elected in a by-election in January of 1894 and had not lost his leadership of the party. The Nationalists showed the greatest anti-Dreyfusard sentiment in Parliament, seeing the affair as a plot to undermine the legitimacy of the military and distrusting Dreyfus on the basis of his Jewish faith. The Workers' Party were in a unique position at the time of the election. Leader Jules Guest viewed the Dreyfus affair as a distraction from the main goal of implementing socialism. But Socialist Deputy Jean Jaurès served as the biggest pro-Dreyfus voice in Parliament, and that most certainly affected public perception of the party as a whole, especially as the deputy and guest were quite close. Now let's see the results! So... Who won? Well, the results alone did not make that clear. The progressives won the most seats once again, but they were nowhere close to a majority. With 43.4% of the vote, they won 232 seats, 59 short of a governing majority. The Radicals came in second, with 187 seats, which while being an increase, still left them very far from a majority as well. The Nationalists came in third, with 106 seats, forming a block on the rightmost side of the House that would give the Progressives a majority, but such a proposition was quickly rolled out. The Workers' Party had come in fourth, with 55 seats, once again increasing their seat total, although this came with leader Jules Guess losing the seat he had won just four years prior. Prime Minister Méline would resign as the new deputies took their seats, and this left the future of a republic very uncertain. President Ford would task multiple men with forming a new government, but they would all fail. Eventually, after weeks of negotiations, it was agreed that Henri Brisson would become Prime Minister, and he would govern with the support of the progressives. These results showed the political divisions that existed in French society, yet they did show one thing the French public was mostly unified behind. Opposition to the Dreyfus Arts. While all the main parties ignored the Dreyfus question for the most part, its significance as an ongoing event greatly impacted the results, and many of the few Dreyfusards in Parliament that existed, such as Jean Jaurès and Progressive Deputy Joseph Reynac, lost their seats to anti-Dreyfusard challengers. Brisson came into office with a weak mandate, similarly to Léon Bourgeois just two years prior. Would he be able to overcome the challenge, or would he fall just like his predecessors? Tune in next time and find out for the election of 1902!